Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, service at Bloomsbury. Uh, for those present, there's rather more of us here this week than there was last, so good to see you all. And for those that are joining the service online or watching the service later, let us gather with our call to worship. Okay, from the order of service then. We gather. God is with us right here and now. Open our lives to our creator. God cares for us and gives us glory. We open our hearts to our creator. God appoints us keeper of the earth. We dedicate ourselves to our creator. So let us remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King.
Let us join together in prayer. Loving God, we thank you for gathering this congregation here today, be that in person, online, now or later. We ask that you bring us today with ears to hear, minds open to your message and hearts willing to respond. Loving God, it is with a sense of despair and dread that we look at the coming week. This congregation knows how hard it was to navigate our immigration system in this country. And yet the government intends to relocate applicants to Rwanda, away from the specialists who can assist and the campaigners who support comforts and encourage those who are having to fight for the opportunities that being here provides and the safety and security from their home circumstances that they've run from. Give us the courage to stand up for what we believe is right and to assist where we can. God of Comfort, we remember that this coming Tuesday will be the fifth anniversary of the Grenfell Fire, a dark day in our city's history, brought about by greed and a lack of concern for the poor and those that had no option but to live there. Aid us to remember the human costs of these failings and ensure that we work for a more equitable world. Draw us, a congregation from across London, together to work with others to establish a more equitable city in accordance with your teaching. The first will be last, and the last will be first. And let us join together in the words that Christ taught us to pray. Loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So again, welcome everyone to this service at Bloomsbury. I'm Matthew, I'm one of the deacons here. I will be leading the service and chairing the panel discussion later. Simon, one of our ministers, will be bringing us the sermon. However, at the moment, I'd like to ask Simon and Jean to come forward. I believe they have a notice for us. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, Jean and I are, are wanting to bring um, a challenge for the congregation here. This is going to be a challenge that you're going to hear more of as uh, time goes by. Um, in November, a group of us from Bloomsbury are going to be revisiting Israel-Palestine. Uh, we had a church trip there a few years ago and uh, a different group are, are going this time. And we really would love to take a financial gift with us as a blessing to the Palestinian Christian community that operate out of Bethlehem. Jean, can you tell us who the We Am Centre, yes, use that one, who the We Am Centre are and who it is that we're, we're wanting to bless with this gift? Yes, We Am uh, first began in 1994, but I encountered them 11 years ago when I went to work in Bethlehem as a human rights observer. And this was one of the organizations that we worked with very closely. They are a Christian NGO and their building is right in the shadow of the wall with an army, uh, an Israeli army base on the other side. And so they are frequently um, hindered in their work by tear gas and stink bombs and you know, all sorts of horrendous things. 
But the work they do is multifold. Um, they, they are a peace and reconciliation organization. So they are trying to bring together Palestinians and Israelis. They are also trying to bring together Muslims and Christians. They're trying to raise the empowerment of women in that part of the world, being very largely uh, a Muslim society, the, the place of women is pretty low. Um, they run summer schools for children, holiday clubs, we would call them, for children during the school holidays. Um, they do a multitude of things. Um, the person I got to know best is the person who is going to be our tour leader, and some of you have met him, Osama, because one of the aspects of the work they do is to run tours for uh, people visiting that part of the world so that they can find out for themselves what the reality of the situation there is. And Usama has qualified as a tour guide from Bethlehem Bible College, which has Baptist origins, Baptist connections. And he is, he is excellent. Um, he knows his stuff really, really well. And nothing is too much effort for him. Thank you. And yes, we also had somebody from there come and preach here, didn't we? We had Zugby oh, come and preach. Yes, Zugby is their director. Um, and he's been, he was the founder. And uh, he, he does travel quite a lot um, to different parts of the world, speaking about the situation in Palestine and Israel and about the work of We Am. Yeah, great. Yeah. And we, we had him come and preach here, didn't we, about three yeah. years ago, I would think now. Time has compressed slightly, but somewhere in that window. Yes. I remember the first time I met Zugby, actually, we were in Manger Square. Uh, we just arrived and I think there aren't many people who look like Jean so she, she kind of not, at least not out there so she stood out a little bit with her with her hair and suddenly he, he'd spotted her across the across the square <laughs> and we were just stood with Jean and suddenly this voice behind us boomed at us show me your passports and we were like what's going on and he had a big smile and there was Zukvi welcoming us to Bethlehem. He was teasing he's actually recently stood for the Bethlehem council I don't know whether he got a place on the council or not. No, Haven't heard. we'll find out. Yeah. So we am this place of justice, reconciliation and Christian witness in Bethlehem and uh, operating in that area. And I just want to ground this idea of taking a financial gift to them in scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul writing to the church in Corinth says, now concerning the collection for the saints, what this is about is Paul is trying to encourage the diaspora church, the Gentile church, to send money back to the Christians in and around Jerusalem. He says, concerning the collection for the saints, you should follow the directions I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside and save whatever extra you earn so that the collection need not be taken when I come. In other words... An offering is not, what have you got loose in your pocket today? Come on, give us a tenner or a 20 if you're feeling generous. Giving should always be thought through and planned and systematic and dare I say sacrificial. Now, those of us who are going on this trip are paying quite a lot of money to do this because we pay proper rates and the money goes into the Palestinian economy and it goes into WIAM. But those of you who can't come on this occasion, but who would still like to support the work that we're doing there and help build the links, please do begin to think about how you can be generous to uh, support the work of WIAM. I'm not asking for money today. That's not the way we're doing it. We will find ways to announce uh, that you can give this money, but just begin to think about how you can be properly generous to support the work of WIAM so that when we from Bloomsbury go there in November, we can take a proper love gift from this fellowship to support the work they're doing there. Thank you so much. On that note, it would be appropriate to give thanks for the giving to this church and the work that we do here be that through the hardship fund or through the general giving. 
Lord, we thank you for the generosity to this church and its operation. We thank you for the gifts that we give from the gifts that you've given us. We ask that your guidance would be on those that are responsible for the spending of that money, that it may be done to further your aims. Amen. For those that wish to, as you leave, there is a contactless payment method at the back of the church by the doors. But that is entirely at your discretion. But now I'd ask Jean to come up and bring us our reading for this morning. Our reading this morning is Psalm 8, and we're reading the whole psalm. The Psalm of David. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. And we stand to sing. Jesus is Lord. Creation's voice proclaims it.
now may I invite Simon to come and bring us his word. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, just before I start the sermon, a couple of uh, what we did this week moments for you, because uh, both your ministers were involved in conferences this week, and I think it's nice that you hear what we're doing. So yesterday I was speaking at the conference for the Joint Public Issues Team, which is the joint venture between the Baptists, the Methodists and the United Reformed Church that exists to help the churches engage in justice issues uh, and political issues uh, in this country particularly. Um, their website's always worth a visit and yesterday I was uh, leading a couple of sessions for them on a theology of hope and how that contends churches, give churches the imagination to get involved in works of justice in the world. Um, and then earlier in the week, Dawn was joining remotely uh, the conference by Fresh Streams. This is the uh, Evangelical Baptist Network, uh, and they have a conference every year. And this year, their conference was looking at issues around human sexuality. And Dawn and Luke were both involved in that. And uh, you, you can probably imagine that this conference coming from the more conservative end of Baptist life, uh, this is a really big thing for them to have a conference where they are genuinely seeking to hear voices uh, from both sides of the human sexuality debate. And everything I have heard coming out of that conference is that it was well done, uh, it was constructive, it was positive, and I'm hearing it described as the most significant conversation the Baptists have had yet at a wider level on the issue of human sexuality. So I just thought it would be good for you to hear that there is ongoing movement on that one and ongoing engagement, but also to hear what I was doing in terms of uh, stuff around um, justice and hope. But let's turn our attention now to uh, the text before us for this morning, uh, to this psalm from Psalm 8. Do you ever, I wonder, look at people who really ought to be on top of the world and find yourself wondering why it is that they actually seem to be in the pits of despair? Do you ever wonder at the choices they have made that has set their path on a route that promises so much, but in the end delivers so little. At a celebrity level, it seems that almost as soon as someone gets enough money, fame and power to mean that they can do whatever they want, with whomever they want, wherever they want, they're at imminent risk of spiralling down the path to alcohol or drug dependency, as they, I guess, seek to mask the feelings of worthlessness that continue to threaten to overwhelm them. Maybe having too much choice in life is something which is harder to deal with than it might at first appear. And whether it's the beautiful, talented and traumatised jazz and soul singer Amy Winehouse, whose statue up at Camden Market I was looking at recently, or the moodily brooding musician and poet Pete Doherty, it seems that low self-esteem is something which no amount of money, talent or tabloid exposure can ever cure. But of course, it's not just celebs who suffer from low self-esteem. They just have the money to do it in style. All around us, there are people who are plagued by hopelessness when they stop and consider their own lives. Every day we meet those who struggle to make sense of their own brief existence on the earth. There are those of us who struggle with the choices we have made and the consequences they have for us. As Shakespeare said, Oh, gentlemen, the time of life is short. So what's the point of this life? What are humans here for? Is there any purpose to our fleeting existence? These are the questions that are haunting the writer of Psalm 8, who is seeking to puzzle out God's purpose for humans. Something that's interesting about the answer that the psalmist proposes to the question of the meaning of life is that he doesn't start with human beings at all. And this is quite unexpected, I think. After all, we might expect a short poem on God's purpose for humans to start by talking about the human condition, much as I have just tried to do in introducing my sermon. 
outlining who we are, what our strengths and weaknesses are, the choices we're going to make. That feels like the right place to start. How are we going to respond to this mysterious thing called life that we seem to have inherited from our parents? But no, the writer of Psalm 8, only nine verses of it, doesn't even mention humans until we get to verse 4. Verses 1 to 3 are all about God and God's creation. Verse 1, let's hear it again. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. This is how the writer of this psalm chooses to begin. Humans only come into things once the might and majesty of God has been asserted. The psalmist goes on. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, then we get to verse four. What are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them. This, it seems to me, could be the classic starting point for a statement on low self-esteem. If God is so great, so majestic, so glorious, so powerful, then what could God possibly want with me, little, insignificant, flawed, hopeless me? So where then does the psalmist go next? Well, it certainly isn't into a statement of despair. Rather, he links to the next verse with that most wonderful of words, yet. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honour. It seems that in spite of the insignificance when compared to the vastness and majesty of God, nonetheless, yet, God is still mindful of us. God has crowned us with glory. We have been made only a little lower than God. This is no low view of humanity. In fact, what we see are divine characteristics being ascribed to humans. Glory and honour are characteristics of God, and yet the psalmist claims that God has given these to human beings as well. But he doesn't stop there. Having defined human beings in relation to the heavenly beings, he then goes on to define us in relation to all the other creatures which share this world of ours, saying... You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also all beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. As humans, we are not only crowned with glory and honour, but we also exercise dominion over the natural world on God's behalf and at God's request. This is, for the Psalms, an unusually positive view of humanity. Everything ordered, everything in its place. Humans are presented in this Psalm as the pinnacle of creation, almost God-like, ruling the planet because God has asked us to do so. And those of us who know the creation story from Genesis will, of course, be making links here with the way in which that story describes humans being given dominion over the earth. I'm just going to read a few verses from Genesis 1. and You'll hear how these two texts interact. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth. 
and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything he had made. And indeed, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning. The sixth day. In both Psalm 8 and the creation story from Genesis, it is humans who are given the pivotal role in God's plan for the good ordering of the universe. Humans are given not just the gift of life, but also the gift of choice. Life, it seems, is about choices. We get to choose what kind of creatures we will be. We get to choose what kind of dominion we will exercise. It is we who are entrusted with the task of keeping the world ordered and secure on God's behalf. As we exercise our God-given dominion, having been made in God's image, having been crowned with glory and honour. It is humans who hold back the forces of chaos that would otherwise threaten to overwhelm the earth. This is the view of these two texts, Genesis 1 and Psalm 8. And so the answer which the psalmist is wanting to give to the question of God's purpose for humanity is that we have this divine mandate to exercise authority and responsibility in the ordering of and caring for God's world. This is a high, unusually high view of humanity. Except there is this nagging doubt at the back of my mind, and it may be that it's in yours too. My doubt is that this does not really seem to describe what I see when I look at the world around me and the role of humans in the created order. Do I see humans exercising God-given dominion with responsibility and care? Do I see an ordered world where everything has its place and where humans are playing their pivotal role in ensuring the stability of creation? Surely we have to say absolutely not in answer to that question. Rather, we see humans consistently exploiting creation for their own selfish gain. From habitat, habitat destruction to rainforest clearance to global warming, the list could go on and on. I think we're a very long way from the psalmist's high ideals of God's purpose for humans. It seems that the freedom we have to choose good is also the freedom to choose evil. The freedom to choose selfishly rather than selflessly. How quickly the divine mandate to care for creation becomes an excuse for oppression and distortion. Think for a minute about the song which many of us have sung in school. I mentioned this last year when I was preaching on Psalm 1, so forgive me repeating myself, but I think it bears repeating. It starts off very much like Psalm 8, with its assertion of the careful ordering of creation. You know the song, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful. The Lord God made them all, each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings. He made their glowing colours, he made their tiny wings. Just like Psalm 8, it starts with this statement about God and creation. So far, so good. The earth is made good by God who is good. Well, where do humans fit into this? We get that in the next verse. He gave us eyes to see them and lips that we might tell how great is God Almighty, who has made all things well. According to this Sunday school hymn, our task in this well-ordered, non-chaotic, well-made world is to testify to the one who created the earth and placed us in it. It's all very Psalm 8. It's all very Genesis chapter 1. 
Um, I have a friend who uh, a few years ago caught um, Lyme disease. Uh, she was out camping uh, without a tent in the moors and contracted Lyme disease. Um, it's a horrible disease. And uh, she reflected to me that she would only ever sing this slightly saccharine, cloying, perfect Sunday school hymn again if someone in wrote and included a verse about Lyme disease, which they had recently had. So I thought I'd oblige. So here is my additional verse about Lyme disease. This is uh, copyright me. Ticks that carry Lyme disease are made by God as well. Things that make us ill at ease and make our armpits swell. Survival of the fittest is part of how things work. Immunity is needed to fight off other germs. Well, it's not high poetry, but you kind of get the point. And then there's that other verse that was written by the author of the hymn, which I can remember singing as a child, but which has mysteriously disappeared from most modern hymn books which feature this song. And it's this verse, which certainly to our modern ears, hints that the well-ordered world spoken of in the opening verses of All Things Bright and Beautiful might not be quite as wonderful as it might at first appear. You know this verse? The rich man in his castle the poor man at his gate. God made them high or lowly and fashioned their estate. The implication here is that the extreme imbalance of power and wealth in the world is also something which is ordained by God and is part of God's plan for creation. Rather than, as some of us might want to assert, the consequence of human choice and action and sin. According to the hymn, the economic and social oppression of the poor man begging at the gate of the rich man's castle is that this is as God ordered and intended it to be. And I think now if we start to look carefully at both the hymn and the psalm, the cracks are starting to show. In the psalmist's bold assertion that God's purpose for humans is to exercise godly authority and responsibility and that in that will we find all things good. It might be fine in theory, but when it comes down to it, the powerful always seem to use their God-given dominion to exploit both the natural environment and other human beings, bending creation to their will and resisting the natural order of things. It seems that the greater a person's power, wealth and influence, the greater the choice they have available to them, and the greater the temptation to choose evil and not good. The greater the temptation to choose selfish good rather than the common good. Well, is there a way forward from here? Are we to conclude that ultimately the psalmist read the situation optimistically wrong and that the human exercising of divine dominion will never be anything other than an exercise in oppressive and destructive power and immoral choices. To return to the psalmist's core question, what really is God's purpose for humans? What are we to do with these fleeting days of ours? Something which may help here is to see how this psalm is used in the New Testament. And you may not know this, but it's quoted in the book of Hebrews. I quite like the way it's quoted, because the writer of the book of Hebrews knows that they know it, but they can't remember where it's from. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. But someone, somewhere, has testified, what are human beings that you are mindful of, the more mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honour, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them. But we do see Jesus who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honour because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In the book of Hebrews, Psalm 8 is used to help understand Jesus as the one who ultimately 
rules over all. The human dominion, which the psalmist so boldly asserts, becomes relativized in the mind of the writer of Hebrews by the lordship of Jesus. In the book of Hebrews, it's not just humans who are crowned with glory and honour. Rather, Jesus is the one in whom all glory and honour are embodied. Ours, it seems, is not to be an absolute dominion over the earth. We are not free to choose without care or consequence. Rather, our dominion, our freedom, is to be exercised within the context of the absolute lordship of Jesus. We have choices, and the call is on us to choose not the path of pleasing ourselves, but the path modelled by Jesus, who journeyed through life in selflessness, living for God, living for others, and whose journey took him to the cross. Jesus is the one, as Paul says, in whom all things hold together. Jesus, the one who has ultimate power and dominion, is the one who chooses the path of servanthood, who chooses a life of obedience and service. Jesus' dominion and power are not exercised through control and dictatorship, but through service to others and obedience to God. As Jesus himself said in Mark 10, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Or as Paul puts it in the Christ hymn in Philippians, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, although he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In Jesus, this idea of humans having dominion is still there, but it shifts. The example of dominion and power which Jesus sets is very different from the way in which humans normally exercise their God-given power. The choices modelled by Jesus about the way to be human are choices for life eternal rather than life today. They are choices for the good of all, not for selfish gain. And this changed Jesus' transformed understanding of power and dominion sends us back to the psalm to see if we can read it differently in the light of Jesus' example. What happens if we read this psalm with a Jesus-inspired understanding of honour and glory and power and dominion? Well, firstly, notice that the psalm both starts and finishes with words of praise to God. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It becomes clear that the statement of human dominion over the earth from the middle of the psalm must be read together with the words of praise to God from the beginning and the end. And I think the point becomes clear. Human power must always be bounded and guarded and surrounded by divine praise. And it is this praise of God which gives the human exercising of dominion its appropriate context. I've said it before and I'm sure I'll say it again. Worshipping God is not about making God feel good about himself. We don't sing Jesus is Lord because Jesus is some needy divinity who's desperate for us to articulate how great he is. We say Jesus is Lord and we worship God as almighty because that boundaries where we fit as humans in the exercising of the freedom of choices that we have in our lives. Our worship of God gives us the context within which we can then make good choices. And those who praise God without taking seriously the exercising of human authority are simply abdicating their responsibility. 
I do not think leaving it all to God is an option. But those who seek to use human power without doing so in the context of praise of God end up usurping God's rightful place in the cosmos and so commit to the sin of idolatry. Humans are indeed to rule upon the earth, but we are to do so after the example of Jesus, exercising dominion through serving others in obedience to God, always giving God the ultimate glory and never taking it for ourselves. And it's in giving worship to God that we find divine balance and order that the psalmist so longingly speaks of in the exercising of our dominion. So I think God's purpose for humans is twofold. It is to exercise dominion on God's behalf, and it is also to give worship to God. And those two together are essential. You cannot have one without the other, uh, without unlocking the forces of hell. When we take glory and honour for ourselves, we usurp God, seeking to become like gods ourselves. And when we do this, we lead the world back into chaos. So where, I wonder, does this leave us? In the midst of a world where humans do very much grab glory and honour for themselves, and where dominion over the world is still very much exercised for selfish reasons. Well, in a world that seems intent on slowly leading itself to the gates of hell, we have our choices to make, corporately and individually. Choices which can point the world to the revelation of God's good news, in whom is truly to be found the hope of the nations. We have choices to live as the people of God, showing the world what it means to live as Christ's transformed and restored humanity. Now, I certainly don't think Christians have a monopoly on good news, as they might say on the BBC. Other paths towards enlightenment are also available. There are plenty of people who find paths to peace and justice beyond Christianity, and that too, I am convinced, is God at work in the world. But we have a revelation of God in Christ, and that calls and challenges us to live into being in our community and in our lives, the good news that has been revealed to us. We have a choice and a chance to model what it means to exercise dominion on the earth, not for our own sakes, but for God's sake. To model what it means to give glory and honour to Jesus, rather than to take it for ourselves. The call to selflessness, is inherent in the call to worship Jesus, as we enthrone the one who is love, and in so doing dethrone all those powers that deny and distort love and peace and justice in the world. And as we do this, if we take it seriously, we will find that it will affect our whole lives and the choices we make with them, from how we spend our money, to what we buy, to what we don't buy, to what we give away, to how we use our time and our energy and our power and our voices. All of these can be understood as the exercising of dominion and power. And through the choices that we are called to make in Christ by the Spirit, we can build a vision in the world of what it means to resist the seductions of consumerism, to subvert the narratives of nationalism, to live for others as we live for ourselves, to love others as we love ourselves. In our living, we can make real in the world the truth that there is another better way of being. And I think to do this is our calling in Christ. Because any glory and dominion and power and honour we may think we have are only ours for a fleeting season, because ultimately they belong eternally to Christ. And so our calling is to live into being in our lives and our community, the truth for which we pray, that the kingdom of heaven come on earth as a new kingdom of good news for all, where all are welcomed by the loving embrace of God and where creation is renewed in Christ. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
Thank you, Simon. As we take a minute to think and mull over that, can I ask the panel for the discussion to come forward, please? For those that have joined online via Zoom, you are more than welcome to put your thoughts and your responses into the chat as well. We'll come to those later. Liz, can I start with you? Um, any particular thoughts or reflections from that, sir? Um, I think for me, I mean, the thing I, I always try and make a few notes if I know I'm going to be on the panel um, during the service. And the word that I wrote down, um, or the words I wrote down a lot were yet and um, choice. Um, and how Simon started with the issue of kind of self-esteem. I mean, as somebody who I'm sure, along with many others here, um, you know, struggles with self-esteem. Um, the, the yet is a, uh, is a thing of hope because um, I'm very good at working out, you know, how, how I compare to the worms or whatever, but I'm not necessarily always very good at, at working out how I'm a little lower than, than God. Um, so for me, the, the yet is a, a sort of thing of hope, but then thinking about it in relation to the world, I think I realized that I had that choice to, to look for the yet and to say yet. Um, it isn't, isn't set, I do have a choice to do that. And I, I'm often aware of that. I'm often aware I can go down one route or another um, of how I see myself but also how I see the world, and then also how I see my position in the world and how I relate to the world. Um, so it, it's something to do with hope, but it's also something, a real challenge to me because I'm aware that so many people don't have a choice, really. You know, it's all very well us saying we all have choices, but actually when it comes to the environment, sometimes it's much harder for some to have a choice than others. Um, I'm also aware that I, don't always feel like I have a choice, especially when it come, concerns myself. I don't always feel I have the choice to see myself positively. I don't always see that I have that choice with rely, in, in relation to the world either. Um, and I don't always want to make the choice that I think is right as well, you know, because I want to have the things I want to buy and I want to. So for me, it is hope, but it's also a real challenge. And I guess that's when I've stood here before, I've often talked about perspective. And I think that where I kind of came to with this is the idea of putting God and putting Jesus back into things is really important for me because that helps me make the choice and to see myself and the world differently. And that's what I have to constantly do on a daily basis is a question of, will I have that choice of what perspective I'm gonna take on things? Sometimes that choice is individual. And sometimes it has to be collected. Just... Duncan, have you got any thoughts and notes that you've taken? <laughs> so, Thanks. Like mine and like this. Is... <laughs> well, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that this uh, psalm is by a king, a mythical, legendary king. Um, and it starts with a, an, an address to God as being Lord and Sovereign. Um, and given that we've been thinking a lot about the nature of monarchy in the last few weeks, these ideas seem, you know, very contemporary. Simon touched on this issue of wealth inequality and uh, reminded us of the uh, um, All Creatures Great and Small verse about the rich man in his castle and the poor man in his gate. I did an article, I uh, reading an article in The Economist recently about the countries with the widest wealth inequality. Russia, China, India, and Thailand. And the thing that strikes me about, this is a very contemporary issue, is that in all of those countries, the citizens are encouraged to worship their leaders as gods. India is a little bit more complicated, but if you've seen those images of the Russian school children in the last couple of weeks, pledging their allegiance to Vladimir Putin, you can see the parallel there. Question is, is that a natural order? <laughs> Sometimes it's been presented that way. And I think in our own history, it's been presented that way as well. 
you know, when you look at the image of the queen holding that orb at her coronation, it's got the cross on the top of it. And it's almost as though the queen is holding Christ's world in her hand. So that I think there's a, a problematic, to use a contemporary term, association between using the power of the church and the power of the cross as part of the regalia of, uh, of, the, of the monarchy. Um, and then lastly, on that point about self-esteem, I think the other idea that comes to me is that our self-esteem can change if we undertake esteemable actions. And I wonder what those are. There's something there about our responsibility for the environment, our dominion over the natural world. If we do esteemable things in that realm, perhaps that's a way to raise our self-esteem, both as individuals and as a society. Yeah, what, one of the notes I made was that we don't control the weather. We might mitigate its events. And I look back at Gen in Genesis at the stork tale of the flood, where effectively God is reminding humanity of the limits of our dominion. Tim, thoughts? <laughs> Keep them brief. Um, I'm not sure that I've got anything. I, I wrote down at the beginning too much choice in life, and I thought about um, when I came first to the UK, going shopping was stressful. You'd go to buy butter, which where I had come from was easy. It was just, did you want the big pack or the little one? And here it was far more complex than that. And you even have things called, you know, not like butter, but it seems to be and all sorts of things, you know, let alone all the margarines and all the other spreads. Um, and then I thought about humans having dominion over the world. And I thought, well, the plant kingdom does pretty well on that, really, because when you look at the earth, it's actually plants that probably have to sort of have done the best job of creating earth as, as it is and, and give us oxygen that we breathe. But it's true now, whenever you go in a plane and look down on any piece of land, you nearly always see the effects that man has placed on it. And it's hard not to see a road or a set of buildings or in some places just entirely, this is all man-made, it's all farmland or cities or roads or um, plastic um, greenhouses. Um, but where does that, that's not very helpful, is it? So um, we have choices, we have enlightenment uh, about a way of looking at this through Jesus, which I really liked, um, to model what Jesus did and um, sort of American slogan, what would Jesus do in this situation? It's sort of slightly kind of galling, but I think Liz put it brilliantly in sort of bringing Jesus into the, helping us to have perspective on these decisions that we make and what would, you know, and what would he do it is maybe a, putting it in that perspective way is maybe an easier way. So to show a better way of being the kingdom of God. Sorry, not very helpful, but yeah, this is, I was just called to this at the last minute, wrote some notes. That's absolutely fine, Tim. Thank you for your thoughts. I know that when I first read the site online in preparation for this, uh, for leading this panel or chairing this panel, my re immediate response to the both, sorry, my immediate response to um, the, to the readings in particular, as I do when we have our fourth Sunday afternoon service is to turn to hymns. And I found myself starting out with O oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder and remembering my commute when I was at university, which was a walk along the towpath with the railway line on one side, blatting through occasionally on an intercity train, but the embankment on the far side and that quiet and calm of the natural environment that was there and the joy of occasionally seeing the flash of electric blue as a kingfisher dived into the canal. But then later in the sermon, as I read through, I found myself with Graham Kendrick's Servant King. Hands that flung stars into space, to cruel nails surrendered. This is our God, the Servant King, and we're called to follow and to give our lives as that offering and to place that creation that we're stewards of above ourselves. 
Idoka, are there any thoughts in chat that I should be coming over to uh, review? In which case, I'll bring the mic. So I can read out a couple of thoughts. So um, Jeff asks if monetary success really makes people more likely to have mental issues, um, or is it just that the media only take an interest when those issues surface, but it's with a famous person, which um, I do believe it's the latter. Um, he also asks, to what extent do we have dominion over other people's thoughts and, and raises the example of Mary Whitehouse, who was something of a conservative firebrand um, in her day and says that the whole sermon works within a view of God as external, giving from external to internal. Um, translating that model of God into a model where God is incarnate needs more work. What Jesus and Christianity bring to this is that when we think of our decisions, we become, become conscious that our choices are either selfish or altruistic or perhaps even neutral. Thank you to those at home and thank you, panel. Uh, unless anyone's got any final thoughts, that makes sense. In which case, let us stand again in, and join in singing. Made in God's image, all life began. So as this is the first Sunday after Pentecost, I invite us to consider how the Holy Spirit touches our lives as individuals and as a community. Let us pray. 
Loving God, we thank you for your advocate who enables us to experience and respond to the otherwise intangible aspects of your divine power. Through your spirit, we can connect, if we choose, to you and to others. Open us more fully to this experience so that we experience your comfort and your guidance. We give you praise for believers who have held fast to faith in difficult circumstances. We think of those who live in countries where there's been a growing lack of religious tolerance. And we especially pray for those in places where acts of worship have been interrupted by violence. May your spirit bring peace to those situations. We confess that there are parts of our lives in which we have blocked out the light, ways in which we've grieved the spirit. We focused on our own gratification, we've acted selfishly, we've been impatient, hypocritical and judgmental. Forgive us and let the spirit of truth enlighten us and guide our actions to better outcomes. We thank you for the peace, people who support us, our friends and our families. We thank you for our church community in which each of us can bring our own particular skills and experiences to help each other. We pray for those whose vocations are devoted to helping others, including those who care for our physical and mental well-being, for those who keep us safe, well and nourished, for those who entertain us and for the people who educate us. Thank you for the way in which your spirit guides the members of our diaconate and we ask for your blessing on their meeting this afternoon. And indeed, we ask for your blessing on all the committees, conferences, seminars, webinars and meetings in which we're involved. We pray that we would each better perceive the promptings of the spirit in all areas of our lives. May it accept the guidance in all our activities, whether individually or in groups. Enable us to see the best path to take and as alert us to the obstacles or the distractions which could lead us off course. We offer our praise, we offer our prayers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we stand to sing our final hymn. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation.
And now as we leave, I pray that God's blessing will be on each of us, that his encouragement will be there for us to see our roles and for us to see how best to act as we go out into the world. Amen. Glad to see everyone here. There is tea and coffee, coffee in the foyer there. Please, if you can, do stay. And the visitors in particular, make yourselves known to us. Thank you. Thank you.